um, the team members and the friends. Um, really very grateful um, for tuning in today to mark the 20th anniversary of the landmark UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Um, I did uh, interact with most of you, but those uh, whom I did not. Uh, my name is Mohammed al Nasseri, and I'm the Regional Director of UN Women uh, in the Asia and the Pacific, and I have the honor to be your moderator today. Um, I speak for myself, uh, but also all uh, my team to say that we're really delighted uh, to celebrate this anniversary with a very distinguished um, panel of academia, uh, activists, uh, government, as well as uh, what looks to be a grand and growing audience. Uh, 20 years ago um, this week, exactly, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 1325. This resolution was a long time coming, following years of mobilization of, and activism by the feminist movements, recent wars, particularly two in Asia Pacific, in Nepal and Afghanistan, were marked by significant violence against women and girls. Exhausted by these conflicts and locked out from the negotiating table, women fought hard for the five years following the Beijing Declaration in 1995 to break into one of the most male-dominated spaces of decision-making, the UN Security Council. Under the leadership of one woman from our region, Ambassador Anwar Shodari, uh, representing Bangladesh as the Council President, the collaboration and coordination of women's groups, NGOs, and activists paid off gender and security to areas that had hitherto seldom be, been merged were recognized not only as interrelated, but inextric inextricably linked. Uh, often described as one of the crowning achievements of the global women's movement, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda was born out of activism and leadership of women from the Asia Pacific region. Since its infancy, it has been shaped and molded by the women of this region, responding to tragedies, often man-made, to improve their communities. The women of Asia Pacific fought time and time again, test after test, to put this agenda to work. The first test of the agenda came in 2001, just a year after the 1325 adoption, when delegations from Afghanistan convened in Bonn to decide on a plan for governing the country, four women out of 36 delegates were included in the talks. The resulting agreement mandated that women led several ministries and an independent human rights commission. These talks set the stage for women globally to demand inclusion in peace and security processes. Four years later, in 2005, the Asia Pacific region again set the stage for the evolution of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. The Indian Ocean tsunami stunned the region, killing more than 220,000 people across 12 countries, shockingly and inexplicably, women died at higher rates than men across the region. In Sri Lanka, twice as many displaced women as men were killed. In Aceh, Indonesia, up to four times more women than men were found dead. Analysis of the tsunami after the fact revealed that gender inequality was the, the culprit. For the first time, evidence of the disproportionate impact of conflict and disasters on women and girls was bluntly exposed. Near the end of the 2000s, conflicts in other parts of the world raged as well. In 2007, the first ever all-female peacekeeping unit deployed from India to the UN peacekeeping mission in Liberia. This unit not only had a profound impact on the women and girls in the Liberian communities, but reportedly changed the way that all other units interacted with the population. 
They taught Liberian women self-defense skills, trained local security actors on responding to gender-based violence, and served as role models for local girls. Upon the last rotation departing Liberia almost a decade later in 2016, Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, herself a trailblazer as the first elected female head of state in Africa and a Nobel Prize winner, said to the troops, our security service now has 17% women. We owe all that to you because it was not even 1% a few years ago. The contribution you have made in inspiring Liberian women, for that we will always be grateful. At the same time, in the Philippines, Asia's longest running insurgency and a staggering 13 years of male-led peace negotiations finally came to close. In 2010, the government of the Philippines appointed a woman, Miriam Coronel Ferrer, to lead the government's team in peace negotiations with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Ultimately, women comprised five of the 12 negotiators or 40% of those at the table. In 2014, the team reached a final peace agreement, which included provisions on women's rights and participation in half of its articles, as well as 5% allocation of development funds to support women's return to normal life, setting a model for other such agreements. This achievement also made Coronel Ferrer the first and only woman chief negotiator to date in history to sign a major peace accord. Bringing us to present day, a pandemic which first emerged in our region and has since turned our world upside down. Features yet again were featured bringing us to present day and a pandemic which first emerged in our region and since turned our world completely upside down, features yet again women from the Asia Pacific stepping up to display global leadership. Women are on the front lines of COVID in Asia Pacific as healthcare workers, caretakers, and community responders. Women and girls heeded the call of Secretary General Guterres for a global ceasefire to fight the pandemic, leading to the first cessation in fighting in 16 years in Thailand's deep south, offering wary advocates there, there a glimpse of hope for peace. Out of the tragedies of the Asia Pacific, women have fought and triumphed to make the women peace and security agenda what it is today but there is still a long way to go. Women are still underrepresented in formal decision-making with only one in five parliamentary seats in Asia are held by women. This gender disparity has been highlighted during the COVID crisis when women are overwhelmingly missing from the pandemic response and decision-making on recovery. Women's participation in peace is still limited. Nearly two decades since the historic token bomb, just five women or 11% are represented on the Afghan government's negotiating team at the current intra-Afghan talks with the Taliban, which began just last month. Violence against women in both conflict and post-conflict settings in the region remains a persistent and critical challenge. In the 20 years since the passage of the Resolution 1325, this violence has grown and spread alongside new technologies, with women encountering violent misogyny in their homes, the streets, and now on their mobile phones. The pandemic has only increased the misogyny women experience. During COVID lockdowns and quarantines, Tweets from India, Indonesia, and the Philippines containing mis misogynistic language doubled over week over week in May. We cannot fall short 
of the hard fought, ga fought games of women trailblazers from our region over the last two decades. We must prioritize women's leadership, participation, and rights in not just our peace and security efforts in this region, but also we continue to respond to COVID. Today, we will celebrate the advancements we've made over the last 20 years for women, peace and security, but we will also look forward to the future. There is much work to be done for us all. To preview today's course of events, to, to begin the discussion, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Jackie True, our great friend who is the Professor of International Relations and Director of the Center for Gender, Peace and Security at Monash University. Professor True has been working with us and collaborating with us in the region to review the data on 20 years of women, peace and security in Asia Pacific. And she will give us a brief overview of her findings. After that, we will hear from the civil society and governments from Afghanistan, Nepal, Timor-Leste, and Indonesia, respectively, who will give us a brief glimpse of the state of women, peace and security 20 years on in each context. Lastly, we will open the floor for question and answer from the audience. We ask that you please add your questions to the question and answer box as the event goes on, and we will let we will get to them at the end. If you have any general comments for the audience or panelists, please add those to the discussion box. Now, let me turn over to Professor Drew. Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mohammed. It's a great pleasure to be here with um, colleagues uh, from around the region, from Indonesia, Nepal, Timor-Leste, and Afghanistan to reflect on 20 years of women, peace and security um, and the challenges uh, that we have in um, moving forward uh, in that agenda. Um, so today I just want to really provide um, a brief overview um, of a paper that uh, reviews uh, the progress and, and the challenges. Um, certainly the 20th anniversary that we commemorate this week um, is a critical moment for the Women, Peace and Security agenda and its relevance, which um, as Mohammed has already mentioned, has been tested this year by the extensive impacts of COVID-19. But I think it's a great opportunity nonetheless to take stock of the progress as well as the gaps in implementing women, peace and security in, in, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and I think Mohammed has already referred to a number of the lessons learned. Um, and I think it's really important to, to appreciate um, those in this region. Um, uh, in, in, the, in, in reviewing this progress, um, I'm primarily using the UN Women's Definition of Asia uh, and the Pacific, um, which is not quite as an extensive as the SCAP um, definition. Um, but if we, for a moment, take the SCAP definition, we can see that it's an incredibly diverse and varied region um, and the only global region to include, uh, you know, three Security Council permanent members. Um, so, uh, you know, I think uh, this should be really reflected um, in, in how we understand the, the impact of the agenda in the region. Um, I'm just looking at the slides here and I can't quite sleep, see the slides that have been shown, but I would say um, the next, not the title slide, but the next slide. So the Women, Peace and Security agenda is meaningful. Yes, so you can perhaps, perhaps go, shall we go to the next slide? Um, thank you. Um, it's meaningful to all region, all, all societies in the region. Um, and the, its fundamental purpose is to prevent insecurity and violence by harnessing the potentials of both women and men uh, and addressing those structural gender inequalities and discriminatory gender norms that are barriers to sustainable peace in all societies. So the agenda is really important to remember is wide ranging and goes beyond recognized situations of conflict and emergency um, and, and includes the pre and post-conflict environments of gender inequality and violence 
that destabilize so many communities um, and may also affect national and international peace and security. Um, and as I want to emphasize here, the underrepresentation of the Asia Pacific region and global women peace and security debates um, has meant there's been a lack of visibility of peace and security efforts uh, and lessons learned in the region, other than you know, outside of, of perhaps Afghanistan and Myanmar, which are routinely on the Security Council agenda. So in, in some ways, this has diminished the importance and relevance of the region's overall contribution to achieving women, peace and security. Can I have the next slide, please? I'd like to just take a moment to just share some, some basic data information on, on uh, changes uh, since two, the year 2000. And often when we look at this, we can look at the glass as half full or the glass is half empty. I mean, certainly as a scholar, it's very easy for me to note the shortcomings, um, the gaps, but I think this is a moment where we should also highlight the progress that is hard won. Uh, and can be built upon in the coming years. So if we take, for example, the four pillars of the Women, Peace and Security agenda and start with participation, what has been the progress in the region to date? So in, in 2020, we can see 14 countries now in the region with national action plans. Um, and we can see, um, I think, um, though we can still say there's, there's um, you know, much to be, um, done with regard to increasing and enhancing women's participation in peacekeeping. We have gone from zero female peacekeepers in UN operations to 723 uh, over the 20 year period. And, and that, that, is a, that is an achievement. Um, and though that, that hails from 12 different troop contributing countries in the region. Women have reached one third of peace negotiators in the Philippines, uh, as, as Mohammed already mentioned, uh, in, in the, um, the Bank Zamora agreement uh, and the agreements in, in, in 2014. Since 2010, so in the last 10 years, we have recognized 82 women peace builders and gender equality advocates through the uh, UNDP's End Peace Initiative um, across seven countries in the region. We've established two networks with 45 women experts on peace processes and mediation in Asia Pacific. Um, and we've found that in the region, 59% of the peace agreements since 2000 have substantive gender provisions, gender equality and women's rights provisions, and relative to other regions above average implementation. With regard to the, the protection pillar, um, and I think this is really striking, we have gone from in 2000, just seven countries with laws against domestic violence, to 34 countries with laws against domestic violence. Now, of course, that doesn't mean, you know, that those laws are fully implemented in practice, but nonetheless, the achievement of those laws providing a framework in which prevention can occur is really significant. Um, we can see now in 2020 that women constitute across the region 10% of the police force, um, and that is above the global average of 9%. And certainly, uh, this is an area women's participation in the security sector that can be built upon. We can see women hold 20% of prosecutorial roles and 23% of judicial appointments in the region. And that has been shown to have a major impact on all women's access to justice. With regard to the prevention pillar, um, and this is again, a really important pillar. Um, I, I just want to highlight one, one major um, indicator of progress. And that is um, that we now have um, the first countries in the world in this region to, um, to, to develop uh, national action plans to prevent and counter violent extremism that include specific explicit commitments to women's participation and to gender equality responsive policy and programs. And there I refer to the Philippines and Indonesia. With regard to the relief and recovery pillar, um, Mohammed has already mentioned this, but I'd like to say that, that the, um, the comprehensive agreement on the Banks of Moro in, uh, in the Philippines, that peace agreement is the the, one of the first in the world to include a specific gender financing provision allocating 5% of development funds to support women's participation and return to normal life. So that really is as path breaking provision and one we should continue to watch 
in the implementation phase. We've seen some quite significant uh, decreases uh, in maternal mortality, um, and, which is uh, often a major, um, major impact and also it exacerbated in conflict, disaster and, and fragile situations. So maternal mortality has been cut by two thirds in the, uh, in the region overall across the 20 year period. We've also seen a significant increase uh, in the reporting of, of trafficking cases, you know, 80% of which uh, involve women and girls, um, suggesting that the governance responses have significantly increased across the two decades. So now let me turn, like having noted that progress um, and that meaningful progress, now let me turn to sort of highlight just five persistent challenges. Could I have the ne next slide, please? Um, and look, there are more challenges in these five, but I just want to mention these five for now. So whilst globally, we've seen 12 uh, regional organizations adopt action plans on women, peace and security to provide a regional framework for sharing and diffusing uh, what works um, and, uh, and you know, policy uh, transfer. There's no uh, such regional action plan in any part of the Asia Pacific region. So at the same time, we have the uh, ASEAN in, in, in Southeast Asia providing joint statements in 2017 and 2019, really acknowledging the importance of women, peace and security uh, as a framework for addressing the gendered effects of crises um, and advocating for the mainstreaming of gender. Uh, gender equality into peace building and conflict resolution processes. So there's much to be built on there. Secondly, we have seen some really important champions of women, peace and security among our political leaders in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and we can point to leaders in Indonesia, in South Korea, in Australia, in India, um, but there are not enough women, peace and security champions yet at the, at the high level political level. And we'd like to see more, uh, you know, in the 39 countries in the region in the future. And related to this um, uh, political dimension, women's participation in peace uh, is still limited. And here, not just peace processes, but also post-conflict uh, institutions. So, I mean, no doubt on everybody's mind is, is the fact that it is hard one that there are four women or 11% of the Afghan government's negotiating side in the current intra-Afghan talks with the Taliban. Um, but nonetheless, this is quite limited. Um, and we also see quite limited women's participation in the banks of Moro post-conflict institutions in the Philippines. So this is an area really of, of ongoing challenge. Fourthly, and perhaps this should have been the first persistent challenge, gender-based violence is widespread in the region. Uh, and, you know, obviously Asia is, Asia Pacific is an enormous region. Uh, it has the largest population, but it also has the largest number of women killed um, at the last recorded year, 2017. Um, you know, so, in just a couple of things here. In Indonesia, domestic violence is the second highest cause of violent death. In Papua New Guinea, um, there's this extremely high um, rate of uh, uh, death rate uh, from domestic violence, but from allegations of witchcraft. Um, so, you know, it's not, there are a range of different types of violence against women and girls um, that continue to be um, widespread and, and systematic. And fifth, um, we've seen an overall uh, decrease in rates of early marriage in the region, um, but it is, uh, you know, there, there still needs to be much greater reduction uh, in those rates in order to secure women's rights and women's security. Um, and, and early marriage is, a, it is an indicator of women's insecurity and it does potentially weaken sources of resilience and recovery in the region. So whilst we've seen, um, uh, you know, rates halve in Southern Asia, that's less the case in South East. East Asia and certainly in the in the Pacific there's only been a slight decrease in rates of early marriage. 
Now I just want to turn to five lessons learned. Um, there are many lessons learned, but just to highlight a few of those, um, thanks for already changing the slide there. Um, and again, I just wanna highlight the lessons learned by each of the women, peace and security pillars. So with regard to participation, um, I, it is really significant that the region does have models of how to advance women's meaningful participation in peace processes and in the context of ethnic, religious and culturally diverse settings. Um, and the, again, the Philippines model from the Comprehensive Agreement for the Banks of Mora is really significant um, and does offer really important lessons learned for Afghanistan and other contexts in the region. How to bring women in, um, in, in cultural settings where um, they experience significant subordination and norms against their participation. With regard to protection, there are many lessons learned here, um, but protection from gender-based violence, um, we have seen in the context of humanitarian responses to disasters, that it has been possible in that response to promote longer term peace building and greater awareness and responsiveness to gender-based violence. Um, even, you know, uh, and I think I want, want just to point there to the, the, the response to Cyclone Nargis and, and 2010-11 in Myanmar, um, also generating much greater response and awareness of gender-based violence, but also um, with regard to the um, tsunami, uh, the 2004 tsunami that Muhammad already mentioned and the impact on Sri Lanka and Indonesia and particularly on not just deaths, but uh, insecurity um, of women. But nonetheless, the learning from those crises and the responses to the, those crises having promoted much greater responsiveness to gender-based violence. Um, with regard to prevention, lessons learned. I think this is a super important lesson. Um, here, I think we've seen that women's conflict prevention efforts at the community level may be more effective than that of traditional security providers. And that is precisely because those efforts by women and women-led organizations don't stop when the conflict or violence is officially ended, but rather they carry over uh, into communal conflicts and into more recently the prevention of violent extremism. So it's really important to support and sustain um, uh, those uh, women's efforts and those organizations um, that continue peace building, whatever the crisis, whatever the context, and that extends to COVID. With respect to relief and recovery, I think the region offers many lessons learned for the world here. Uh, and that is because Asia Pacific has faced so many non-conflict crises with regard to disasters, climate induced disasters and, and pandemics, most recent pandemic, but previous to that. And as a result, early warning and preparedness initiatives that um, have been developed at the community level, often by women and often involved uh, gender responsive planning. Um, and in some contexts in the region, we've seen really significant partnerships between government and civil society that have incre increased the scale and reach of these um, early warning uh, and preparedness responses. Um, and in other contexts, there's there's you know much um, you know much room and much and, and many possibilities to, to learn from uh, from those experiences. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So let me come now to the, uh, the current crisis, that uh, global pandemic that we're experiencing and, and that the Asia Pacific region um, uh, has experienced. Um, you know, in many ways, we can see many examples of extremely effective responses to COVID in Asia. And that is that should be underscored and that women are frontline responders in that response and at the local level, at the community level, as well as on, on, on the front line of healthcare responses. I would argue that the women, peace and security agenda has never been more relevant than during the global pandemic. And the importance of women's meaningful participation has been demonstrated by the effectiveness of these responses in some countries in the region, especially those with greater gender equality, and often those with women leaders, if not women leaders of state, women leaders in, in, in the medical profession, women leaders um, 
in, in, the, in the health response. At the same time, the, the universal shadow pandemic of domestic and gender-based violence has shown the serious consequences for women's security in the region, especially in most vulnerable communities that are already affected um, you know, by fragility and conflict. Um, and both the pandemic and the shadow pandemic really demonstrate the importance of a gender inclusive human security response. And that is what the Women, Peace and Security Agenda promises. Um, at the same time, I also think that the visibility of the women uh, in frontline roles as essential workers responding to the crisis has increased, has shown that when women are on the front lines, the visibility of gender-based violence that women and girls experience is also um, highlighted. And so I think that COVID um, creates an opportunity for a women peace, and women, peace and security framework to be further uh, embedded in the region to enhance resilience and peace. And I think that, you know, there are some urgent recommendations here for the region. And I think, you know, just to highlight three, it's, it's extremely important to en en enable women's participation in decision-making around COVID and to showcase women leaders and women-led civil society organizations who are effectively responding. Now is the time to promote greater gender inclusion and decision-making, um, especially when those decisions impact all communities and may impact women unequally, undermining their capacities to contribute to the recovery and especially to the economic recovery. Uh, another recommendation is, is really the need for rapid gender analyses on COVID-19 impacts, which UN Women has been leading, um, but these need to continue to inform inclusive governance, especially in situations, situations that we have in the Asia Pacific region where equal and diverse representation is not yet achieved. And thirdly, you know, we really need to protect women's rights and reduce sexual and gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19. Sexual and gender-based violence is not a new phenomenon, but it is being exacerbated and we can expect it, uh, you know, to increase in, in, uh, and we, all indications we have are that it is increasing in, in severity um, as, as well as in, in frequency. Finally, um, to the final slide, what is the way forward uh, for the next few, few years? And I'm not gonna say the next decade or 20 years, because that's way too long to think. We need to think about the next few years. Uh, and looking ahead, I'd like to highlight four key issues that I think are really important to the future development and influence of the agenda, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in the Asia Pacific region. So just to highlight again, the focus on women's participation in peace and security, it must extend beyond peace processes and emergencies to recovery. Um, to recovery from conflict and post-conflict institutions and really setting targets around women's participation and decision-making, to recovery from disaster, uh, especially with the likelihood of increased disasters with climate change and recovery from uh, pandemics. Um, so this is, this is crucial uh, and this is much needed in the region. Second, ensuring our approach to peace and security is for everyone will require more men to become champions of women, peace and security um, and men's leadership for greater gender inclusion in peace and security sectors uh, and in decision-making. There's lots of room here um, for men to follow the lead of women champions of women, peace and security. Third, uh, gaps in protection must be addressed. Uh, you know, laws must be implemented. Um, and we can see that laws are not being implemented in practice in many parts of the region as for example, uh, you know, shelters are not, um, not fully accessible during the current pandemic. Um, and countries in the region must commit to tackling uh, violence and setting tar region-wide targets, uh, building on the existing frameworks for reducing this violence and enforcing sanctions against it where that may be available for conflict-related gender-based violence. And also to say that the Women, Peace and Security Framework has the potential to address gender-sensitive protection in the context of violent extremism in the region. Fourth, 
More emphasis needs to be placed in the region on conflict and crisis prevention and the recognition of women mediators in mitigating crises. Um, and this is so important. We've seen, we, we can see, you know, the, the growth of women mediators and the visibility of those mediators in responding to crises. And now we need much more of a focus on that crisis prevention and the role of women in that. So just to finally say, um, you know, in my view, women, peace and security is, is not only a gender equality and peace agenda, but it's fundamentally about prevention. Um, and the agenda has encouraged women's everyday roles in prevention uh, and the development of gender sensitive early warning indicators of conflict and security, violent extremism, extreme weather events and other impending disasters in the region. And we can see that right, you know, right from Afghanistan through to the Pacific Islands. But further action really needs to be taken to operationalize these systems and these women's roles to create accountable institutional mechanisms for conflict and crisis prevention. I'm really positive about the future of women, peace and security in the Asia Pacific region. Um, given the resilience and resourcefulness of its people in the face of crises and multiple crises, and especially uh, the resilience and resourcefulness of women frontline responders. And at the same time, the amazing progress in gender equality and sustainable economic development we've seen in the region. So thank you very much. Uh, and I, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, uh, this was very comprehensive and crisp. Um, I'm very grateful that you've injected a sense of urgency that we cannot wait for another 20 years to have a review and to see what the impact has been. I'm also uh, thankful that you put a silver lining on COVID and, and uh, seen the opportunity there for, for the women, peace and security agenda globally, but specifically in the region. Um, without further ado, allow me to um, turn to uh, Ms. Orzala Nermet, who is the director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Um, she will take us um, on a, a very brief journey about the participation uh, pillar of women, peace and security as it relates to Afghanistan. Uh, Ms. Nermat, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Nasseri. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be part of this panel. Um, also, I'd like to thank Professor True for a very comprehensive study and presenting a lot of uh, uh, points that uh, could be easily rep uh, representative and relevant to the case that I will be uh, talking about. Given the limitation of time, I will be very brief to sort of bring you a, 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 an overview of uh, the progress we have made in the last 20 years on this very particular occasion of uh, celebrating the 20 years of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Um, as mentioned by uh, distinguished speakers uh, earlier, Afghanistan has made a significant progress in terms of advancement of women, in terms of particularly women's participation and women's role in the decision making over the past years, because the same 20 years we are uh, um, marking today in the sense of uh, Resolution 1325 also equals to the same 20 years after a very critical situation that the Afghan women and the Afghan people in general were coming out of, which was ruling of a regime that was denying in a complete uh, sense the, any kind of a public role for women, the Taliban regime. Uh, although the struggle for women's uh, rights, the struggle for women's uh, uh, political participation goes back to 200 years, in Afghanistan and countries uh, similar to Afghanistan. But because of the recent years and protracted years of war and conflict, and particularly the latest one of which was uh, from 1996 to 2001, we have faced a kind of a situation where we had to start a lot of things from the very uh, basic uh, scratches. The struggle that was ongoing despite the ruling of the regime was also a significant contribution to any progress we have made in the course of the 20 years. So today, as we speak, we are in a very critical juncture of our history uh, where the conflict, unfortunately, is taking lives on a daily basis. Afghans are being killed. Just yesterday, we had a horrible 
uh, incident where girls and boys attending uh, um, university preparatory exams uh, courses were targeted by a suicide attack. These are very, very poor families from poor communities across the country trying to give an, uh, uh, make an effort to basically learn uh, uh, and educate themselves and empower themselves because they have seen what it means to be empowered as a man and also as a woman. And unfortunately, in this critical situation and uh, juncture that we are, there is still a, a, a very serious and realistic threat that we go back to the same period of 1996 to 2001, because there is a peace talk going on, as mentioned by uh, respectful um, speakers. And in this peace talks, there are two sides. One still coming with zero woman representative, even as a symbolic uh, gesture. Another one, at least the Republic side, is having at least six women, which is quite important and significant, highlighting the uh, achievements of uh, the last 20 years. So within this context of um, current situation, it's really critical to see where we are as women in Afghanistan and uh, in part of the broader region, Asia Pacific, that we are now talking about. So under these circumstances, in terms of where we are, there are all kinds of blames and in, in attacks over women in Afghanistan. We have communicated this message to the world that Afghan women are not passive recipients of aid and support, that we are. We have been throughout the history, particularly in the most challenging time of the history. We have been active agents for change. We've tried to use our opportunities to make a progress in ways that was possible whether it was running home-based literacy classes during the Taliban regime in a clandestine way, or by fighting for gender budgeting within the parliament, which was extremely male dominant and with very limited space and position for women, or through research. I'm leading the leading think tank in Afghanistan called Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. And we, as a think tank in Afghanistan, as an independent think tank, I must say, are a pioneer for gender studies. We have systematic studies on livelihoods with a specific lens of gender in mind. We have studies systematically looking into gender and masculinity. And all these are trying to highlight the reality of Afghan society and how changes can come from the bottom up. So I am pleased to uh, share at least one uh, uh, of examples of these uh, stories. Uh, and I mentioned briefly before about, you know, the challenges in terms of um, blames that we are receiving from the opponents and saying, oh, you know, now, thanks to the international support, partly it's true. We have had tremendous international support here, which brought a lot of changes and a lot of positive, uh, you know, benefits to the Afghanistan in general and to the Afghan women in particular. But it also brought sometimes challenges and issues. One blame we take is that you are a very minority city and urban based, you know, Western educated uh, women and the majority of Afghanistan, 71% of which are rural Afghans, rural Afghan women, they are not bothering about what you are talking about. In order to challenge that, ARU conducted a research, uh, which is highlighting cases studies of life stories um, of women across the country. And for example, from Nangarhar, which is one of the eastern provinces in Afghanistan, quite a center, an epicenter, unfortunately, for conflict and ongoing violence. We've come across women who are playing a very active role in local conflict resolution and peace building. These are community leaders who have been supported through some programs in the initiatives empowering women, but they've also shown a very sort of genuine leadership skills by you know, taking part in the resolution of very serious levels of conflict existing in their communities, from violence against women matters to even cases of murder, cases of, you know, disputes between uh, two families. They have been an active, uh, you know, player and 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 um, resolving these conflicts. So similarly, we have uh, stories from Bamiyan province in central highlands in Afghanistan, from Balkh in the northern region of Afghanistan, where a woman is now working as a district governor who recently have uh, managed to reconcile a, a group of Taliban uh, to, the, to the peace process. And when it comes to the question of peace, it's a very nationwide men and women message uh, by all who are trying to uh, highlight the importance of, you know, being completely tired of this ongoing and senseless violence and having a unified voice for peace. But the women of Afghanistan, 
in the peace process are also quite uh, active and quite salient, the role that they are playing. One, they, we have our representatives within the negotiation team, but we don't get only satisfied by that. There are women active in the civil society in different pl platforms trying to promote the idea that we cannot afford returning back to the dark ages. So in sum, what I can say about the life story of an Afghan woman is that we are not ready to surrender one and second, I, I believe more sort of looking at the 20 years, uh, the recent 20 years is the fact that uh, in Afghanistan, within the civil society, within the government institutions, from private sector to security sector to, to put women in politics, women in religious civil society and all that, women are becoming an undeniable force that uh, no matter who is aiming to come back to power, they have no choice but to accept this reality and um, uh, ensure that their rights are respected to the level possible within our constitutional framework. Thank you very much. And um, I will stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nermat. Um, it's incredibly heartening to hear the activism that is still ongoing uh, in Afghanistan by, by your good self and those uh, many who are fighting for peace every day. The situation is not easy and indeed what happened yesterday was yet another uh, sen senseless, um, disheartening uh, event of violence. Um, you're not only going to be in our thoughts, but we commit to continue to work very closely with you on the agenda in Afghanistan. Uh, next, we will be hearing from Ms. Jaya uh, Lewintel, who is the President and the Chief Executive Officer of the NGO, The Story Kitchen in Nepal. Uh, first, we will show a brief video of a survivor of conflict related sexual violence um, in Nepal telling her story. Uh, just a warning, this video will discuss sexual violence, which might be triggering to some individuals. Um, the video is about three minutes. Um, if you would like to step away from the computer for that time, afterwards, uh, Ms. Lun Lunital will discuss the current situation of Nepal post-conflict and protection efforts. Um, if we can show the video, please. मेरो मना आइले धेरे बलिए भएको छ दिदी बहिनीलाई भेटे कुरा सुने आफ्ना कुरा सुनाए त्यसपछि मेरो पनि मान्छे रहेछ नि भन्न लाग्यो आज भोलि मेरो मन बलियो छ पहिला मेरो मन धेरै कमजोर थियो आफ्नो मनको कुरा सुन्दिने बुझे दिने दिदी बहिनी पाएको छु तर सरकारले मेरो कुरा कहिले सुन्छ धुन्द चरके सँगै सेना हाम्रो घर आइरहन्थ्यो कहिले कुटपिट गरेर फर्किन्थ्यो कहिले गाली गरेर अनि कहिले भने पकाएको खाना भरी पेसा फेरि फर्किन्थ्यो 2059 साल जेठको 19 गते राति अति नै भयो सेना आउनेलाई के रात के दिन त्यो रात पनि सेनाहरु रात 2 बजे घरमा आयो एक सा जाना भंडा ढेरे थियो। सिरमान ले बच्चा हरुलाए हमरो घर वाटा समातेरा चिमे की घर में लगे लाखियो। मोलाए भाने मेरे ही घर भी इतरा चार घंटा सम्मा कूट पीट करियो। मोलाए बलात्कार करियो। सामे को बलात्कार कारण हिन्ने ना सकने भाये। जसो तसो उपचार को लागी अस्पताल गए अस्पताल जान्दा माओवादी लाए खाना खाने देने मानसे हो भने आउस दीपनी पाए ना महिले घरेलू उपचार ने करे महिले काचो बेसार थी चे तेल में पकायो भैंसु को गोबर समत से के दुई महीना पाची बल्ला बल्ला हिन्न सकने भाईये मेरो सिरमान के पानी उन हरे को कुटाई बाटा ढाड मा गहिरो चोट लागे को रही छा उपचार को खर्च ना भैरा वहाँ के पानी एक वर्ष पछि 60 साल असारमा मृत्यु भयो छोराको पनि 
कुटपीट का कारण दिमाग ठीक ना हाथ खुट्टा चल ना देश में परिवर्तन भयो अपनो अधिकार आंधे जैसे तो लागयो आशा पलाय को थियो हमरो घटना को छानपीन राज्य ला करला जस्तो लागयो अस्ति को चुनाव मा नेता हरु वोट मांगना मेरो घर में आयो मुला लागयो जब वे मुला दुखो पारियो तेते बेला मुला सहयोग करने के थी ना ते भैरा मेले जवाब दियो पहले सहयोग करना कोई आयो ना आइले तो मुलाय में वोट दिन ना देश में शांति आयो सेना पुली माओवादी घर में आये रा दिन रात सताऊं न तो तारा मेरो दुखा को दिन उस तय छा मोरा मेरो परिवार लाई कहिले न्याय होन छा Uh, a powerful video indeed. Uh, and now, without further ado, uh, Ms. Uh, Luinetel, we would love to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Muhammad. Uh, I am so honored to be here today to share about our work and uh, particularly uh, the voices of the survivors that we have just uh, watched together. Uh, this is, uh, this is very disheartening and then it is very uh, difficult uh, for women to live with all these experiences when their issues are not being resolved or not being addressed in, uh, in Nepal. Uh, you know, because we, if we look into our uh, background or into our history of uh, armed conflict, the armed conflict ended in 2006, 10 years long armed conflict. And after, even after 2006, it's been already 14 years, women have been living uh, with these uh, stories within them. And uh, they have decided to come forward and break their silence using all these technologies by, uh, by Story Kitchen, you know, supported them to uh, tweak in their voices and they are using their art, they are using their uh, sculptures, they have made uh, they have made during uh, the story digital storytelling workshops so women women have uh, come forward to break their silence and they have realized that uh, their sufferings and their pain and the human rights violations they had to face Nepal, during nepal's armed conflict uh, it has been silenced so, so they realized it and they have uh, come forward and we would like to thank un women nepal uh, for supporting our work uh, so that women can break their silence using all these technologies and the digital stories. And this story is different. I have to say today in this platform that, that this story is different, not because it is just uh, bringing the stories of suffering uh, and the resilience, but this story brings the experience of woman from her own perspective, from her own writing. This is the story not written by Story Kitchen, this is the story written by the survivor herself. And the whole idea of this digital storytelling is how we can put women at the center of their stories rather than us defining and telling their stories, but they are telling their stories of suffering and the resilience and how they have fought against the injustices they have been uh, facing in the society they are living. So this is written by the survivor herself and uh, Story Kitchen supported her uh, in all those you know, technical parts to assemble it. And the sculptures, you have also noticed those sculptures, she had made it with the use of clay uh, and it is all done by the, uh, by the survivor. So the Story Kitchen is, uh, has been working uh, with the women survivors of armed conflict uh, since last five years. And with UN Women's support, we have been able to work together with the women survivors of Nepal's 10 years long armed conflict, conflict who faced sexual violence, rape and uh, torture at that time. And I have to say that the, the voices uh, of the women and the sufferings of the women who faced sexual violence, torture uh, and rape uh, during that time, during uh, the Nepal's 10 years long armed conflict, it has been silenced because there is data of how many people were murdered or killed at that time. There is data of enforced disappearances and there is also data of uh, injury and disability. But 
the state actually did not keep the data of uh, the information on the survivors of sexual violence and rape and uh, and the torture and because of this right after the peace uh, si signing of the peace occurred other family members of the victims of other human rights violations uh, they at least received the relief program distributed by nepal's government but all the women who faced sexual violence rape and torture they have not received any kind of relief and recovery uh, during this process so their voice is silenced and their uh, their issues are not addressed and we felt that you know women are not being heard women are being silenced who faced a sexual violence rape and torture at that time and though we were sharing only one video which was uh, in which uh, the woman was talking about the state army at that time but the case and incidents that have been recorded by the story kitchen uh, we working with the women survivors it is from both sides both sides of conflicting party so i also wanted to you know put this disclaimer uh, during uh, during my presentation uh, as well so this is how women are uh fighting the injustices and then they are uh, coming forward uh, but you know they haven't been able to disclose their identities that is even that is very difficult for us to how to create that space for that women can disclose their identity because of the uh, stigma from their society because of the stigma from their family and they they might face security Uh, threats and uh, there is a, a high level of risk for them if they come out and then share about all the perpetrator uh, so this is how we are finding ways uh, to bring women together and uh, support them to break their silence uh, so they can feel that they are shifting this uh, because when they they were silent uh, they were keeping this guilt and shame within them but now they have started Uh, breaking the silence they are shifting the blame and the shame to the perpetrator and that is giving them relief the relief that is not created by the government or that is not given by some external parties but they are finding ways to find that relief within them as well and the most important part here we need to understand is they are the writers and they are the editors of their own uh, stories and they don't need to wait for any journalist or wait for any researcher or lawyer to document their stories so they have got power to document their own stories and they have also found a space for healing a safe and brave space for healing because the externalization that happens after they bring out all these stories they put it on the paper and uh, they use it art and clay therapy to express their uh, sufferings and they put it together and story kitchen is just there to support them Uh, technically to put it together to put the disclaimer to put the subtitle so this is how we have been doing and uh, to come to the overall issue of women peace and security as we are already in the 20th year 20th years of women peace and security uh, issue and there has been already 1325 and other subsequent resolutions on this women peace and security and nepal also had the first phase of national action plan implemented but that action action plan could not respond and could not address the issue of women survivors of uh, sexual violence and rape and torture that happened to women during nepal's armed conflict uh, so there has been some work um, done the tremendous work done uh, to bring the draft of national action plan second phase but we it is yet to be endorsed by the uh, nepal government and the overall transitional justice issue uh, though nepal government says that peace process is already completed but the victims of nepal's armed conflict including the women survivors and victims of nepal's armed conflict they haven't got uh, justice and in the cases of sexual violence and rape they haven't even got any kind of uh, relief and they have so many uh, physical health issues they have so many psychosocial uh, psychosocial health issues which has not been uh, addressed so this is the scenario and the transitional justice issue is not in the priority of nepal uh, government and i would like to i would also like to request i would also like to uh, say from this platform that uh, how the international support can be generated uh, to support the victims and survivors of nepal and also to give pressure to the nepal government to address uh, the issue of impunity which is uh, prevailing here and because of this impunity there has been so many other cases of sexual violence and rape uh, are 
uh, happening and particularly in the in the crisis of this covid 19 pandemic uh, the numbers are increasing and it is because of the impunity that that has not been addressed uh, by the uh, nepal government so i would like to uh, at last i would like to say that uh, from the survivors the when we take it uh, through the survivors led process when they take lead in this process then uh, their agency and their voices can be uh, they, they can they can exercise their agency and their voices can be heard. Uh, but at one level, women are coming forward and they are breaking silence. But the impunity is at the same level; it is not being addressed, and it will again, you know, frustrate the women. And it would not give women to feel that they are they are finding some space to uh, justice. And women have come forward. Uh, to uh, to talk with us and to told them told us that okay we want to document our stories because uh, because they have lost faith in the government and they really want to document all these stories all the truth that happened to them uh, which was committed on uh, against them during Nepal's armed conflict uh, so I would like to request uh, that uh, not watching only watching this video but also uh, having some empathy on the on the lives of the survivors and how they are taking forward their life but again with that guilt and shame uh, within them but again you know they are finding some space to gather together to heal themselves and also getting uh, organized so i would like to request uh, nepal government to uh, endorse the national action plan uh, second phase which is trying to address the issues of sexual violence survivors of Nepal's armed conflict, uh, and also to the international community uh, to support the survivors uh, who are uh, gathering their courage to come out and break their silence, and also to uh, uh, give pressure to the Nepal government to follow the international human rights uh, framework and also to support the survivors of sexual violence, uh, rape, and torture that uh, those were committed on women during Nepal's uh, armed conflict. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Mohammed. Thank you, Jaya. The strength of Nepali women is an example to all of us, and you do have our support to continue working closely on the agenda in, in Nepal, not only the peace and security, but also the transitional justice, which is an important part of, of sustaining peace. Um, we will hear next from Mr. Joaquim Jose Gusmao, Dos Reis Martins, who is the Secretary of State for Civil Protection, Timor Leste, with a case study on the peacekeeping pillar of the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security in Timor Leste, uh, which had, was just implemented from 2016 to 2020. The Secretary has pre recorded his remarks so that we can subtitle these in English uh, for the audience who does not speak Portuguese. Unmute the video, please. Please be the single here, April 2016. For the liberation of the Governo, a tudo ona, compromisso, pode rabelar PAN 325, to e a base. Neve serviço a muto, o instituição governo, sanudo recém rua, sociedade civil, no apoio, russi, UN Woman, liu russi, fundos russi, embaixada Japão, e a Timor-Leste, no governo suede. Mas que ia ona política de a russi governo, no parlamento nacional, Inclui artigo 17 e a Constituição da PTL, ratificação da concessão, convenção, será no adopta o outro por cento todo o número do afeto e a representação e a Parlamento Nacional. Certo, será, será o que é prioridade, não oportunidade, tamba, preconceito, não limitação, vara, nem vê, discrimina na fata, teto, no tal na fata, teto. E a segunda classe não prevê se si a minha participação ativa e a repaz, prevenção, não resolução do conflito, não processo de desenvolvimento. Mas o governo e a compromisso de gênero no Ministério do Interior Raça lidera, não coordena PAN 325, popular PAN, 
participação, prevenção, proteção, no Rani Paz, no IA Estabelecimento Centro Nacional Sega, pode ler a recomendação do seu comitê da recepção, busca de alós na reconciliação, feito a contribuição Sira e a tempo passado, lá reconhece no feito Sira na vítima de ação de direitos humanos do seu tempo passado, Val la eligible la programa asistencia social gobierno mío. No más la cualificado va subsidio veterano mío. Feto víctima violación sexual, sira. No sira ne ve y a Resultado de si violación sexual mío. Val se continúa esta discriminación y a sira ni a comunidad de Lara. Consecuencia va víctima sira ne ve sofre tortura. Anestam, prisioneiras e a tempo passado, perto no mani, se dá e a atenção específica do Basira. No mos, se dá e a política ruma a tu reta atenção específica ou de for tratamento Basira em amoras físico, ta mental, por si acto tortura no violação. E da neve ele continua ciclo sofrimento a tempo naro. Objetivo importante por si haribás marca ato. Por reconhecimento, não recompensa o afeto sira de sofrimento do da vítima durante o conflito passado, não reconhece o afeto de contribuição à libertação. A tu raçai, não remete o afeto timor-leste de minha participação ativa na liderança, o afeto timor-leste e o esforço da paz no Jari Estado-nação e o setor do mundo. Resultado de não atingir durante o Tinanjar Va a implementación, agenda, feto, paz, con seguridad, PAN 325, marca. Resultado del curso PAN 325, Bele Recata, ahora, Bésica Actividad de Procento, Lima Nulo, Cusi, Líneas Ministeriales, San Nulo, Recién Rua, comienza a implementar. No balón, incluye PAN 325 y así en el plano a San Anual, o a la ocasión de orzamiento, y a 2019, a Muto Grijón, a Cus Rua, Rua Nulo Recién Rua, Dólares Americanos. Y el sila de papel. Y de ne incluye institución en esa policía, defensa, no justicia. Mos a todo atención a tu asa efecto de mar y a desenvolvimiento institucional. Ministerio Interior y a una medida comunitaria en el Hatnulu. El efecto representa el presente Hatnulu residencial. No usa modelo de aproximación y mediación para el conflicto comunitario, para el caso civil sila, no es sensible para el género. No se sabe el diploma ministerial de la guión o el mediador Sira Pussi Institución Saídele. PNTL adopta una estrategia de género para la primera vez. No se crea más que nada para responder a la barrera de la personal de la Sira y a la PNTL a solo. No se sabe que la actual institución se responde a la desigualdad de género y a la PNTL no es comunidad. Y a la monitorización de la guión Relaciona o PAN 325, o dados desagrega PIR sexo e arrelatório CIRA com si linhas misteriais. Funcionário CIRA Valon deve participar em implementação PAN 325, no tu informação com a validerança transformativa, no porcento ou no número residual, a tudo ou na mudança de caráter, caráter a tu promove igualdade de gênero. Governo, se for te a ação CIRA deve precisar, vai afetar CIRA e o futuro, no Hari Paz y a Timor Este, Liu Husi. Hasai, feto de participación y a aspecto roto, precisa criar oportunidades para feto, acto contribuir para el desarrollo no construcción de Estado. Si el suceso no involucra feto, ni a participación, ni a mediación, ni a conflicto comunitario, vele, vele, feto, ni a proceso, acto prepara, no contribuir para la respuesta, para el asunto de desastres naturales. Institución de nivel nacional, no, y a nivel municipio, precisa fue oportunidad de Janesa, va a afectar a Romane, a tu participa y a actividad de Sira, a tu colía, no discute con la afecto ni a necesidades de beberle, incluir y a recuperación por su COVID-19. Fue formación va a afectar a Sira, a tu asar Sira en el conocimiento, no cría ambiente de encoraje a afecto, a tu sai cargo de lideranza, a juju su nivel local, todo nacional. Governo e a seriedade a total e a prática do compromisso outro deve aprovar a ONU a decidir um outro feito, mane, colaborar e sira 
Belegosa sirve de direito, nebe a tur ona e a Constituição, tratados, no Convenção Internacional Gira TV, Timor-Leste ratifica, não adopta nada. Precisa a parceria entre o governo, parceiro de desenvolvimento, no Agência das Nações Unidas, na sociedade civil, ato halaco, discriminação, no promove igualdade e aspecto voto, modisnia, bafeto, mane, no labarexira, ato cidadã voto, vele mois e adame, no estabilidade, pode atingir bem-estar. Ministério Interior, orgulho, a equipa toma, parceiro Cira, Anessa, Sociedade Civil, Linhas Ministeriais, Líder Comunitário, PNTL, FFDTL, No UN Woman, o apoio do Japão, Nebe Hatur Tuni, Cira Nia Vontade, a Clara Turum Governo, pode atingir, meta Cira, Liga ao Plano Ação Nacional 325. E no resto, e a compromisso, a gente continua a implementar a agenda feito paz na segurança, com a comunidade local, a Tobele contribui para o movimento global. O governo de Timor-Leste está tudo no compromisso para a igualdade. Thank you very much. And, and now, uh, without further ado, uh, we move to Indonesia. Um, um, Mr. Harry Prabo, the acting director of the International Security and Disarmament um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. Um, um, he will be uh, talking to, uh, to us about how Indonesia have pushed uh, for women in the peacekeeping in the region. Um, and as we all know, Indonesia is um, uh, a global leader in, in this area. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and I have the honor to um, deliver this presentation on behalf of uh, my deputy minister, Ambassador Fabrian Rudyard, who was initially planning to uh, speak uh, directly uh, in this meeting but unfortunately due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, he wouldn't be able to do so. And he requested me uh, to deliver this presentation on his behalf. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank UN Women for convening this very timely discussion. As we are celebrating uh, the 20th anniversary of the adoption of UNSC resolution uh, 1325 on women, peace and security, Indeed, uh, this is very timely for us to seek ways and means to continue furthering the implementation of this resolution. We also appreciate all speakers for their very insightful presentation on the four pillars of resolution 1325. Uh, distinguished participants, promoting the role of women in measures for sustaining peace is a part of Indonesia's peace diplomacy. It reflects Indonesia's effort at national level in empowering and advancing women's role. It also serves as Indonesia's commitment to foster women's meaningful participation in creating sustainable peace as agent of peace and agent of change. Indonesia is of the view that women as agents of peace are valuable assets for Indonesia's foreign policy. And through that vein, this policy is materialized through Indonesia's commitment to continuously contribute in deploying female peacekeepers at UN missions. In this regard, although Indonesia has many initiatives on the field of women, peace and security, as requested by the organizer, I wish to focus my presentation on the role of female peacekeepers. Indonesia's footprints in advancing the role of female female peacekeepers have been proven. As of today, we deploy 156 female peacekeepers from a total number of 2,080, 40 personnel currently being deployed from both military and police in seven UN peacekeeping missions. This has put Indonesia in the position of the largest troops and police contributing countries among ASEAN members the third largest TPCC in the Pacific after Nepal and Bangladesh, and the seventh largest TPCC among 
119 other contributing countries. Since 1999, Indonesia has sent more than 570 female peacekeepers in total to various UN missions. Female personnel play significant roles in supporting the success of UN peacekeeping missions. They have the ability to gain trust from local community and provide better protection in conflict, particularly to women and children in the host community. And most of all, female peacekeepers will contribute to the whole process of sustaining peace by empowering local women and act as role model for security sector reform. During this pandemic time, female peacekeepers are also in the front line to help community and local government in fighting COVID-19. Indonesia's female peacekeepers, for instance, are promoting health education to local community in coping with the pandemic, including to children. Against this backdrop, Indonesia, in our capacity as president of the UN Security Council last August, initiated resolution 2538 on women in peacekeeping. This resolution is co-sponsored by 97 UN members, including all of the United Nations Security Council members. Uh, due to the unanimous support of the Security Council members, this resolution is also called a presidential tax. The adoption of this resolution further reaffirms Indonesia's commitment to promote the role of women in the peace process and as a bridge builder and consensus maker in the midst of rivalries of major world powers. This is a historic resolution uh, as the first UN Security Council resolution that focuses on the role of female personnel in the UN peacekeeping mission. This resolution focuses on measures to promote concerted effort to continuously increase number and role of female peacekeepers in peacekeeping operations, while also underlining the importance of ensuring an enabling environment for female peacekeepers on the field. The resolution also includes provision to promote training and capacity building while also increasing safety and security of female personnel, among others by fostering sharing experience and information through network of female peacekeepers and strengthening cooperation between the UN and regional organizations to increase participation of female peacekeepers. This resolution, moreover, aims to contribute to increase the number of female peacekeepers in line with the 2018-2028 gender parity strategy. As of today, 5.4% uh, 5 5 of military and 15.1% of police components are female peacekeepers, uh, which has risen from 30 from 3.3 percent of military and 10.2 percent of police in 2015. Uh, the number has risen but of course we have to do more to reach parity. In this regard we are still facing structural and cultural challenges in optimizing the increase of the numbers and the role of female peacekeepers that we need to address both internally in the sending countries, as well as in the host countries. Indonesia therefore continues to work together with all stakeholders in ensuring enabling working environment for female peacekeepers by increasing gender sensitive infrastructure and tools, providing additional training for female peacekeepers for particular capabilities, and integrating pre-deployment training curriculum on gender perspective including measures to prevent and counter sexual abuse. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my presentation, this 20th anniversary of Resolution 1325 is indeed timely for all of us to reflect 
upon our commitment in promoting the role of women as agents of peace. And Indonesia is fully committed to, not, to increase the number as well as the role of female peacekeepers as part of this endeavor to foster a broader, balanced, sustained, and multi-layered approach for ensuring a robust implementation of women, peace, and security agenda. I thank you. Thank you so much, Director Prabhu, and um, thanks to Indonesia for being um, the, uh, a strong leader in the Security Council on, on this area and continuing to push for having more women peacekeepers. Uh, we are um, hugely over time, but uh, in, in intentionally I did not um, uh, try to manage uh, the time of the interventions of only of the panelists, given the, the wealth and depth of what uh, everyone had to share with us today. Um, we will move now to the question and answer uh, section, and there are a few uh, questions um, from um, the, uh, the participants. Um, and uh, so far, these are three. Um, maybe uh, allow me to, um, to read the, the first, and it's uh, aimed to Dr. True. Um, and it goes as follows, Men, uh, that Dr. True has mentioned that one of the persistent challenges in the region is that there are still very few women peace and security champions in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, why do we see so few women peace and security champions in the region and what needs to be done to change this pattern? Uh, Dr. Chu, if you may uh, attempt to, uh, to answer this uh, as briefly as possible. And of course, we can go back to the participants with lengthier um, answers in writing later. Um, Jackie, the floor is yours. Uh, absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure I can answer why there are so few champions, but it perhaps relates to the fact that the, the agenda is, has, could be further institutionalized. So to the fact that there are, you know, still only 14 countries with national action plans, uh, no regional action plan. However, I think much can be done to promote champions across institutions, uh, across governments, across the security sector and across the region. One thing that could be done could be modeled on what the End Peace Network has done to recognize women peace builders and gender equality advocates. We could similarly recognize and reward uh, in, 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 in a kind of a prize award giving ceremony, those champions of the agenda um, uh, and, uh, and across those sectors. And that could be an annual kind of award. I'm not saying it would be like a new Nobel Peace Prize, but something of that nature could elevate the, that institutional leadership. Um, and, and similarly, we could, uh, we could, you know, we could do much more to highlight uh, those champions. We could also see a foreign minister or a political leader who's already a champion decide to promote a network of WPS champions in the region. In the similar way we saw with the Preventing Sexual Violence Initiative led by William, former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, William Hague, where he promoted champions of his initiative uh, across the world. So something could be done in the region uh, it could be initiated, for example, by the Foreign Minister of Korea or the Foreign Minister of Australia, for example, who are champions. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, the following question is a brief one from uh, an, an army professional, John Cole. Um, and he said, how can security guys like me in the army help with advancing women, peace and security in our daily jobs? Um, the question is, is open-ended to uh, the panelists. Um, who would like to take a take on this? Ms. Nehmet. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Mr. Nasiri. Um, uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. John Cole, for your question. 
Um, I think uh, looking at the Afghanistan experience uh, a few years ago, we had uh, a close look at the role of the UPOL, which was a European sponsored, uh, you know, basically army uh, and police support to the police sector in Afghanistan. In one of the, uh, I mean, we did a thorough assessment of this program, and I have to say, in general, the objectives were not really matching the results uh, because they were set in a very ambitious way. But one way that it was very effective was uh, in terms of gender and so providing a sort of a space and an environment where women police officers were able to uh, um, uh, to to work in much more professional areas. Uh, in comparison to uh, uh, before. So there are models, an example, I know your army and army and police have their differences, but I think the example of Afghanistan and the training of army in Afghanistan, particularly focusing on, on, uh, on uh, mentorship in guidance and uh, educational part of uh, training the uh, army officers will have a critical role uh, because um, in our uh, um, army, uh, or military curriculum, uh, the issue of gender uh, uh, mainstreaming is not really addressed. Uh, the issues of human rights are generally not addressed much because our army is uh, being in the war situation and uh, having the terrorism as the main, you know, challenge. Uh, we've been influenced under, you know, direct counterterrorism type of, you know, trainings and approaches which are not much, you know, respectful of human rights and all that. So I think you as an army officer can help in terms of ensuring that at least in the training programs that are provided in different countries, particularly fragile and you know armed conflict countries and societies, you ensure uh, helping with you know um, uh, having gender uh, trainings uh, to uh, uh, army officers. Uh, that, that's like one uh, primary steps that could be taken. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Nahmet. Um, there is a third question that just came uh, in uh, for you. Uh, I would suggest if you may um, help in, in answering it um, in typing in the, in the question and answer section so we can save time. Um, because the third question uh, would go uh, to Jaya. Um, I know that it's a question that can be asked in any context, but it is in relation to the context in Nepal. Is sexual violence and rape commonplace in Nepal in general? Uh, how citizens, public, generally respond to such incidences in present situation? Does the public protest on women's rape and sexual harassment incidents happening in day-to-day uh, -day life, not only in crisis of or post-conflict. So this will be the last question that will be answered live, given that we're 12 um, uh, minutes uh, late. Uh, Jaya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mohammed, uh, And thank you very much for the question. Yes, uh, the cases of rape and sexual violence, uh, they, are, uh, they are there. And then uh, in terms of reporting, I would just like to give you one data, particularly this data is from uh, last uh, two months, July and August, and this data is from uh, Nepal Police Headquarters. So that means, you know, these cases are registered. 420 cases were uh, cases of rape uh, were registered in the Nepal Police Headquarters. And the, in the last year, 2,144 cases were registered. So that means, you know, 2,000 plus uh, cases are being registered uh, in the police headquarter. And I am giving this, the, you this data, only the registered case. There are many more cases which even don't come out uh, from the incident place and then they don't get uh, registered. And uh, your another question was, are there any protests? Yes, we have been doing protests on the, uh, on the street and also on the social media. And social media, if you uh, just go and look for the uh, Nepal rape cases, hashtag Nepal rape cases, you can see the social media protest is also happening. And there are many activists coming together to talk about and against the uh, rape cases and also for the uh, justice of the rape uh, survivors. Uh, but again, the issue here is uh, about impunity. The justice uh, system, uh, it is not uh, accountable to the survivors uh, of the sexual violence, whether be it in during Nepal's armed conflict or uh, during uh, you know so-called normal situation. So the overall issue here about the justice, uh, whether the justice mechanisms are responsible to the survivors or not, no, not at all. 
and because uh, despite of all these protests that is happening on the social media and on the street uh, it is not being heard and uh, there are many women who are still waiting to uh, get justice and there are still many women uh, and their family who are waiting to get uh, justice uh, but our fight uh, continues thank you for the question Thank you so much, uh, Jaya. Uh, thank you again to all the panelists and all those who have dedicated uh, almost two hours of their time to, to hear what uh, these experiences bring to the 1325 agenda in the region. There is uh, a lot to be proud of. And um, again, our region leads the way on so many elements of the agenda, but there is still a very long way to go. Thanks to all the team members who have uh, put in place this um, uh, event today and thank you for uh, uh, providing timely support uh, all along. Uh, as you know, the session has been recorded and we will be sharing with you uh, the main uh, readout of the session with all the participants. Thank you again. Have a good afternoon and a good evening to all. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much Mohammed. Thank, Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you.